I'm Steve Arbaro. This is Lessons in Leadership, the radio show podcast, and now on video. I want to introduce my colleague and friend, I hope today, yeah, Mary yeah. Gamba. Today's a good day, yes. Today's, oh, yeah. stop. Come on. <laughs> We're we always are, friends. We are We're always friends. One of the reasons Mary Gamba, my co-host and colleague, and I are friends every day is because no matter what happens, we seem to be able to work it through uh, and talk it through, which is a leadership trait. And in that spirit, I want to introduce our friend and colleague who deals with difficult challenges every day. He is Kevin Cummings. He is the chairman of the board and the CEO of Investors Bank, a little organization about how big, Kev? About $27 billion in assets. Oh, is that right? In New York and New Jersey, 147 branches. Kevin, why don't we do this? Mary, in just a moment, is going to tell folks how they can find us. But question, your view of leadership. You and I just had a luncheon recently where we, for two hours all we did was talk leadership. How did your, how has your leadership philosophy and approach developed? Well, I tell you, it's evolved. It continues to develop. So it's not uh, developed. It continues to evolve, and hopefully it continues to improve. And I think the attributes of a good leader is you have to influence people, and most importantly, be a good listener. Why the listening piece? God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I think you have to win the hearts of people before you ask for their hand. And it's the emotional connection a good leader has to make things happen. Speaking of listening, uh, we're going to listen as Mary tells folks where they can find our radio show podcast broadcast. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So stand-deliver.com is our website. So you can log on there to find our other podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook, Steve Adubato, PhD, and that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. And to go back to find our previous podcasts, you can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, as well as on Google Play. Also check out AM 970's app, and you'll find our show there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, that sign, again, I'll burn in these different props. I survived another meeting that should have been an email. I know that Kevin wasn't coming <laughs> in to talk about this, but seriously, what is the philosophy or approach at your place, at Investors, for meetings? Is there a meeting philosophy? Well, we'd like to start them on time, and I think I might be one of the uh, worst offenders of that because of our schedules from time to time, but it's the respect that we have for other people that are coming to that meeting, and I think we want to have the meetings be timely but we want everyone to have a voice at that meeting. So come prepared. Well, I'm going to push you a little bit. One of the areas that I do a lot of training and coaching in, and you and I have talked about this, is that I think there are too many meetings. Too many organizations have too many meetings that should be emails. That's the point of that. You send me an email, tell me what needs to be done. Why are we sitting here for an hour with you telling me everything you're doing? I'm telling you everything I'm doing, and we could have just communicated via email. Why don't we have a meeting when we really need to go back and forth, you say? I go another step further. Instead of having an email, get off your butt, walk down two offices, <laughs> wow. and talk to the person, and get it resolved there, <laughs> how as, a, as opposed to copying me. How dare you say don't send an email? Right. Hope, how about this? As leaders, communicators, managers, do we send too many emails? There's too many emails. I'm copied on too many emails. How do you communicate to folks, I don't want to be copied on all these emails? How do you do that? I tell them. Actually, we were involved in a little litigation, and during the uh, depositions, the opposing attorney said to me, I don't see any emails between you and your uh, COO, Dominic Kammer. And I said, of course not. His office is right next to mine. So that's so interesting. I hate to say this expression, old school, but you are old school, which means that you see it the way I do, that certain communication needs to be, should be, and is better for leaders to communicate face-to-face. -face. For sure. Yesterday, I walked around the office, and instead of asking the CFO, let me see the quarterly financials, I went to his office and asked for him. That's atypical for a lot of CEOs. Well, actually, it was fun because I walked by our auditor's office, and KPMG had the door closed, and I knock on the door and said, why is this door closed? Are you guys unsociable? You know, when oh, I was I there, this. we kept the door open. When I worked at KPMG, we kept oh, the door right. open. that's right, you did have that background. Exactly. By the way, when he talks about the auditors, they're coming in to, to do at a normal end. audit. Yeah. Right. How about this? Because Kevin and I also have had this ongoing discussion. They've been a big supporter of what we do in public broadcasting, and we're actually starting a series on sports and society. It's a working title. But the truth is, Kevin and I talk about sports and society a lot, sports and leadership a lot. I mentioned that there are two books I have, one, Urban Meyer, Above the Line, Lessons in Leadership and Life from a Championship Season. He's had some other challenges since that book was published. And this one, Mary, set this up real quick. Our favorite, One of our favorites, Eric Legrand, played at Rutgers, hurt many years ago. It was, I think, 10 years yeah. ago, if you will, mm -hmm. in a game against Army at Rutgers Stadium. Believe the Victoria story of Eric Legrand. 
We should rebroadcast that interview. Yeah, no, I think her. we definitely should rebroadcast it. And yesterday, as a matter of fact, and the reason why I know it was 10 years ago yesterday, we're filming this now in October, that he put out on Twitter a message that simply said, I never knew that when that happened that day, how much my life would change for the better. And who does that? Who has that positive attitude when literally at that moment in, you know, the picture that he put was him laying on the field, everything else was in black and white, his uniform was all red. He was making clear it he was, was paralyzed. He was paralyzed. And instead of seeing it, a lot of people, including myself, I think I would go into a room and cry and feel sorry for myself. And instead he saw it as an opportunity to be an example of inspiration and to go out there and to just say to people, hey, listen, things are going to happen to you, but it's not what happens to you. It's how you react to it that matters. Kevin, is that really what it comes down to? I mean, we talk about Eric LeGrand. I mean, to me, he's an extraordinary leader. And it's not really about just sports, because it could happen in any arena. But to what degree do you see that kind of courage and positive attitude? And it's not just that I've gotten knocked down, but I'm getting back up. How much do you see that in sports and correlated, I know it's a loaded question, to leadership? Well, I think your failures are your biggest opportunities. And your successes, when you become arrogant and you start reading the headlines, they lead to your biggest failures. So it's by learning from those failures is the great growth opportunity, leadership opportunity. And if you're not pushing yourself, afraid of failing, then you're stuck and you're going nowhere. So you have to push yourself to that edge, look at it and say, I got to do something here. You know, and then a, accept it and say, hey, I did my best. It didn't work out. Let's move on to the next project. By the way, if you're checking us out uh, on the audio side, we're Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. This is Lessons in Leadership. We're talking to our longtime friend and colleague, Kevin Cummings from Investors Bank. Let me ask you this. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. Someone will say, I have no regrets. I have no regrets. And I sit there and I go, really, you don't? I have a really long list myself. Now, maybe it's just me, but I don't get that concept. And this is a leadership issue too. A leader who says that he or she has, quote, no regrets, I regret raising my voice in countless situations, losing my, by the way, again, read the opening chapter of Lessons in Leadership, we'll get the point. Blaming other people when I should have been focused more on solutions, being fearful and having insecurities that manifested themselves publicly and made it worse for other people and a million other things. I regret that. Am I using the word regret in the wrong way for you? I don't think it's a bad thing to have regrets. I think everyone has regrets. Do I you have so. any? Oh, for sure. As I a mean, leader? As a business leader, our journey as a company, going from $5 billion to $16 billion, you know, the things we did and the investments we made during that change and, and all the things. Going about 1000 No. And, and looking does? at that, you know, I'm a lot smarter now. If I could do it over, I'd do a ton of things differently. And that's how you learn. And we're doing things now, having learned from those mistakes or misinvestments or different things that we did where we, instead of being $100 million profitable, we could have been 95 and made that $5 million investment, you know, might have a greater impact on our stock price today. So there are things that come through that you learn from, and then you change the direction in the future. It's so interesting, as we listen to uh, Kevin Cummings from Investors Bank, Mary and I talk about this a lot, that leaders come into their positions as CEOs, and again, you don't have to be the CEO to be the leader, from all different backgrounds. You have a finance background. So what I'm fascinated by, because I've often coached people who are the CFO and then potentially mm -hmm. the COO, and I often find, respectfully, Kevin, you, with you being the exception, at least in my view, that not a lot of folks with strong financial backgrounds have what I, Daniel Goleman calls emotional intelligence, the flexibility. I see you shaking your head. I'm not sure if you agree or not. How did you know what you needed to do as a really good finance person, background at KPMG before this, because that wasn't enough to be a leader, was it? Well, I tell you, it depends where you are on your journey. And I think the first part is just trying to be successful. You know, at KPMG, making the partnership. It was a 12-year right. track. Yeah, and there wasn't really much. I wasn't reading many leadership books during you that track. not? No, I wasn't. I was coaching a lot. So you get a lot of benefit there. Okay. You know, Developing doing a lot other of people. Exactly. Okay, I'm sorry. But taking the role of being that CEO, I was a line partner, and I didn't have a, a leadership position. But you're always a leader because you have your team, you have your clients, right. and you have to work through some difficult situations, the late 80s, early 90s. David Brooks has a great book out called The Second Mountain. Yeah, uh, Second right Mountain. Up. You mentioned this before. Yeah. What's the premise? And the premise is people work the first part of their careers, come out of college, they work for that first mountain. And that's the nice house in the suburbs, the nice restaurants, everything, the vacations and all the things, the material gain. And our society has been so focused on that probably post-50s into the 60s in the last 50 years. On the second mountain, though, you make a commitment. 
And that commitment is either to your family, community, a cause, or basically religion of being faithful. Making a difference? Making a difference, exactly. And I think, you know, when you hit your late 40s, early 50s, like when I left KPMG, I saw an opportunity where I could be impactful, not just be successful, but move from success and be significant. And I think the biggest pleasure I get is when I make a difference in another person's life. And I think there are numerous situations. Just recently, we had a situation where we had a bad loan and we were able to work it out. The guy had a problem, had a son with cancer. He subsequently passed away. He called me directly and I took an interest in that situation and we worked it out and now he's staying in the house. The foreclosure process so, has ended. Kevin, say someone said, hey, wait a minute, the leader, particularly who's fiscally responsible and conservative would simply devil's advocate, look at the bottom line and say, bad loan, you got to collect on a loan. You got to do something. Guy defaults. Who cares what the circumstance is? That's not how you, you look know, at it. You know, whether it's HR problems or, or anything, the easy answer is no. You know, do the easy thing. No is easy. Right. How do you salvage the situation and work with that person? You know, we talked about Rutgers before. And I, before I, we got in the air, we're, I'm a graduate of Rutgers, and my graduate and doctoral work there. And, and got my Kevin's, MBA there. He's got his connection there, mm -hmm. too. And, and it's not just Rutgers academics we're big on, but Rutgers sports. And as we do this program, it'll be after the season. They're having a terrible football season. But what does that have to do with leadership? Well, certainly is reacting. How you react, how do you communicate it, how do you keep the enthusiasm of the team and your supporters, whether it be the alumni and, and people like that. But more importantly, I go back even to that Mike Rice era, you know, when Mike when that, Rice, the basketball, the basketball coach, coach, throwing basketballs at the players, abusing them. Go exactly. ahead. Like that AD from a distance. The uh, athletic director. Peretti, I believe his name was. Tim Pernetti. Yeah, yeah. Tim Pernetti. He had a law firm come in, give him advice. He followed the law firm. He did everything by the textbook. The easy thing would have been to fire him day one from his AD position. Sure. And then it goes, gets out, PR nightmare, and he winds up getting fired. Again, lessons in leadership is about what we learn. What, what do you take from that? Well, I think you have to communicate. He didn't communicate enough up the chain. And he made the decision at his level. It was a good decision. I believe he wanted to salvage the guy. Yeah. But he didn't communicate it up the lane. And then once it got nasty up the chain, his boss didn't stand up for him. But I'll often say this without being overly philosophical. I believe in a lot of large organizations, corporations, universities, other places, people stop it where they learn that, again, I did a case study on the Penn State situation with Joe Paterno and the creepy coach. You know the history of went on there. And, and, well, Coach Joe didn't know. Well, I don't know whether he knew or didn't know. But if you do organizations from a leadership and communication point of view and to cover your behind point of view, decide they're going to keep it at a certain level and not raise it to a Kevin Cummings. Well, I'll tell you. John Kirkpatrick, the managing partner in KPMG in 1989, when he told me I was going to, I made the partnership, said, you go alone, you die alone. You go alone, you die alone. Yeah. And he said, if you do it once and you get in trouble, I'll cut off your fingers. You do it two times, I'll cut off your elbow and then your whole arm. I mean, that was a lesson. And I think even when I come up to delicate situations, I'll either speak to a board member or, or the lead director or my former chairman, if he was still there, and just keep them informed on a need-to-know basis. I don't want you to make a decision. I'm just letting you know this is going on. So you got to manage up and you got to manage down. Again, going back to the sports thing, you play basketball. You still play basketball? Sure. <laughs> Saturday morning, 7 o'clock. I know wow. you said this yep. to me. I'm like, no, not happening. Actually, they play on Wednesday nights too, but I had a dinner last night. Uh, you love your basketball. Yeah. Team sport. College basketball. Uh, yeah, we talk about that a lot. Uh, big Seton Hall fan. and Michigan State, the first game. I know it's going to be a big game. Big game. Again. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. You ever do anything with the business school with Mike Rorta? Oh, yeah. Mike is a great friend a great of ours. Man? Mike is a great In fact, Mary. He's got a great newsletter and them? everything. Yeah, he's should fantastic. I disclose I'm teaching at the leadership, at the yeah, Bucino Leadership yeah. Institute. It's not leadership a secret. Academy. It's going to be out there. It's, it's Leadership Institute, I exactly. believe it is. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching there in the spring in the of spring. 2020. That's absolutely correct. I just correct. signed on board. I do one class a year. Good for you. I love it. See, yeah. I think I know Kevin, and we wind up having Every the same time, connections. Every time, it's something new. Let me oh, seriously ask you this. The innovation thing, we've been talking to a lot of people about this. Technology drives innovation. Great leaders see things other people don't see. How challenging has it been for you to communicate to folks around you what you believe the bank needs to do if they frankly believe the bank needs to stay where it is? If you're not changing and getting stronger you're going backwards. 
So you need to be continuing your improvement process because things are changing. And if you think you can act the same, talk the same, produce the same results in a world that today is changing 100 times more quickly than it was 10, 15 years ago, you're kidding yourself. Change is inevitable and innovation, you have to be at the top of your game, continue to improve your processes because the competition is unbelievable. So let me stay on this. Investors has a relationship with the devils. You have a relationship with some other sports figures. Because you and I talked about this recently. New York Giants. Talk about the Giants connection. Mm -hmm. And is there, a, is there a Jets connection? Not presently. But in my mind, there yeah. is because you have Boomer. See, sure. see it's interesting mm -hmm. dynamic here. I'm watching a, a, a Yankee game the other day. Again, I'll date myself. They're in the middle of the playoffs. Just leave it alone. And I see a spot that's coming up for those guys. Now, Boomer, Esiason, and Phil Sims, how are they connected to investors? They're our spokespeople in the marketplace. What does that mean? They're out there promoting our brand. They're two great partners because of who they are. Yes, as individual uh, you know, as brands. As individuals, right. My mom always said, you're known by the people you hang out with. And our partners are the Giants, the Devils, Boomer, and Phil. Fan, F-A-N, Fan. And by the way, that studio, does the, does the studio have the investor's name on it too? Yeah, in the morning wow. show. But that's an investment. But even, you know, Barnabas is Our partners with the devil, well, right. so, so we're involved with them. You know, it's New Jersey-based corporations trying to make the communities better. But what's interesting about that is, again, this book on relationships I often talk about by John Maxwell, how much of your success as a leader comes down to, I know we talk about this almost every show, Mary, spending your time building, developing, cultivating, strengthening relationships. As you move on in the corporate ladder, it's more important to focus on the relationships than the technical matter. Because? Because that's where you get people to step out of their comfort zone, the trust factor builds up, and the direction of the company, they're on board, they're on the bus. So as time goes on, those discussions, you know, I had a difficult discussion yesterday with a senior executive through the budget process. He got the message that he probably didn't want to hear. We need another 10%. And that's those difficult discussions that you need to have. Look them in the eye and say, here's where I'm coming from. Mm. This is what we need. This is the results. Here's where we've been, but here's where we want to go. But he wasn't happy. And Mary, one of the chapters in our book, Lessons in Leadership, comes from the great Colin Powell, Sometimes Great Leaders. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going to make me say it? Yeah, you say it. <laughs> piss people off. Yeah, sometimes great leaders piss people off. Is it difficult for you? Again, you and I talked about being coached by certain kinds of very tough coaches, and we were also went to Catholic school where sometimes I think the rules were different in terms of the way you were spoken to, very aggressive, very much in your face by either the Christian brothers in my case or priests or whomever. The good um, Jesuits in my case. I, I hear you. Maybe there's I, a I little bit I got a quick of a, story, right? Go ahead. Sophomore in high school, we get out of practice late downtown. Where are you at? What school? St. Peter's Prep. That's right. Downtown Jersey City. And some of the local kids, you know, used to chase us away from the bus stop sure. to want to take our money. And so we run to exchange place, get on the bus. I go to class, you know, after Thanksgiving when I got smacked in the head, and bounced my head into the hard bus, big bruise on the middle of my forehead. I go to Father Foley. I said, Father Foley, you know, these guys, I mean, you should have someone out there watching out for us. He looks at me and says, you guys got to toughen up. It's good to take a beating once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Mary. Imagine saying that today. Mary, I, I know you think I no. exaggerate. That That's, is, you better fend for yourself. Yeah. And, and we'll have another discussion about how we've, some of us have overcompensated with our kids and gotten the I other way. I think all of us as a community are overcompensating. I think that's one extreme and where we are now is another and hopefully we'll level we'll, out somewhere we'll, we'll in the middle. We'll find that balance. But I was trying to get to a thing here about pissing people off. How much of your experience in sports as a player as someone who loves sports, who's a student of it. And you've got to make some tough decisions. Coaches do, they sit people down, they do all kinds of things. How much of your ability to do what has to be done on behalf of the company, which sometimes gets people upset, I'm not gonna keep saying piss people off, is easier for you because of that background? Well, it certainly makes it easier. I tell you, when you have personnel decisions, I used the example the other day, when you have to cut a 12-year-old boy or a girl from the basketball team because you have only oh 15, 15 slots, uh. and it's a great kid, and you have to do it. But I think once the decision is made, it's done. You don't keep replaying it, that I do the right thing, that I've done something different. And I think as a leader, 
be decisive, make the decision, and let's move on. Even if some people go home and talk about you behind your back and say, Kevin is this, or Steve out about it. I, Mary and I have this conversation. Too often I've wanted people to, quote, like me. And Mary's like, stop with them liking you. Just do what you need to do. And if they like it, like it. If they well, don't, they don't. Yeah, it's funny, though. I think it's good to have the ability to tell someone they screwed up and almost at the end of the meeting have them thank you. Well, now, I'm sorry, I've never else, seen that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you, there's, an art. Have there's an art to it. You can tell people. It's, it's, it's a teaching moment. That's the way I and, see it. Right. But how you deliver it, your body language, everything else. Right. Like myself, I've worked with executives, you know, within the company at KPMG and at the bank, where the two of us can say the same thing. They get pissed off at someone else, and hopefully I have that likability factor where, hey, all right, maybe I should be thinking about it. It's not just what you say. It's but how you say, say it. exactly. So listen, this is why we, uh, Mary and I, I'm hoping I'm speaking for you, why we love doing lessons in leadership, because not just that we love talking about leadership and learning about it and reading about it and just making mistakes and getting better, but we get to talk to fascinating leaders like you. And, and we've had, probably had 50 conversations with Kevin about leadership, and each time we learn something new. Finally, lifelong learner when it comes to uh, leadership. I don't want to be better than you, Steve, but I want to be better than I was yesterday. So you have to be continually improving. Wow. On that note, I can't think of a better segue. This is uh, Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. This has been Kevin Cummings. By the way, before I let him go, I want to make everyone know that Investor is huge on the philanthropy side. Montclair Film, if you go by Montclair Film in our hometown of Montclair, New Jersey, there's Montclair Film and the name Investors is all over it, right? The Investors Bank Film and Studio Center. It's beautiful. Investors it contribute to so many organizations, the uh, Paper Mill Playhouse and Cal I, I'm, I'm making a mistake by doing that. And also they support what we do on public broadcasting. Thank you, Kevin. Good to be here. We'll be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Steve Adubato, this is Lessons in Leadership with my colleague, Mary Gamba. That was a great conversation we just had with Kevin Cummings from Investors. Your biggest takeaway is, was? With Kevin, it's great. We've spoken to Kevin countless times, and with every time I learn something new, and this time, again, it goes back to the theme of innovation and change or die. And I know we keep talking about it, but it's becoming clearer than ever that you need to always learn from your mistakes and then use them to innovate and try something new. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about this. This whole failure theme, it's so easy to tell people never give up, which, again, I got this one. This logo is from Winston Churchill. Never, 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 ever give up. Okay, but... You know, that's a slogan. What yeah, does that really mean? It's easy to say, too, but it's a lot harder to do. And I think you have one from John Maxwell, who I think is one of the greatest mm -hmm. leadership gurus of our time, who has taught me a great deal from his books. He says... Yeah, he says, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, and the leader adjusts the sails. John Maxwell. What do you take away from that? You could literally divide this, in my opinion, into three sentences. There's people in the world who are pessimists, right? And they just sit there and they complain about everything. They literally complain about the wind. Those types of people are those that are going to fail. They're going to be stagnant. And in leadership, obviously, they're not going to be able to lead their team. You have the optimist who expects it to change. And those are those people that are always looking for new things. But if you don't pull that all together and adjust the sales based on those two things and in leadership to apply it to the workforce, that's literally being aware of market forces, being aware of your own team, and literally just figuring out, OK, this is a new day. What am I going to do with it? And that's what a true leader does. You know, a couple of things, by the way, sorry for this big mess on my desk. I'm just it's got us thinking about a whole bunch of things. We're pulling some uh, whole range of books and articles off of our out of our leadership library. But one of the things that strikes me is this knowing intellectually that having a positive attitude and it's not just what happens, but what you do with it matters. You can know all these things. But what I find and it's not just leadership, but in life as well is you have to constantly remind yourself of this. And I'll give you an example. You know mm -hmm. I live my life by examples, yeah, right? They're yeah. anecdotes. Yeah, stories. Sometimes it's research. Sometimes it's just something that happened. So I, I noticed that when I play golf, that if I'm playing really well, I have a great attitude because I'm playing well and I'm scoring well and everything's fine. But I noticed that the really great golfers deal with a situation that I deal with not so well. They deal with it better than I do is what I mean. Wind. You mentioned the wind. And I sat there and I go, did she just say wind? Because I played golf where 
I'm hitting the ball really well, but the wind's into me. And I complained the other day at where I play with my friends, Nikki and Andy, every weekend. And I said, do you believe that the wind is against us in almost every hole? And they just looked at me and they go, well, I don't know. It's the way that the wind's blowing. Yeah, but I mean, it's just ridiculous. As if, who was I going to talk to about the wind? The reality is the wind is blowing the way the wind is blowing. You have to either deal with it or not play. And then on the next hole, I thought I made a really good putt, but I thought that the green was cut a certain way and the ball didn't go the way it normally goes. What's up with that? And I started saying about, I started <laughs> complaining and I thought, I'm the leadership teacher, I'm the coach, I'm the author, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Because what do you say? This is not overly philosophical. This is what Mary does every time I start on this road. <laughs> you quote someone, the great Artie Lang. Hmm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Get, yeah, I'm, you, sure, I'm sure Nikki and Andy were doing the same thing on the golf course that day. They had wow. no, they the have grass, no patience the grass guy. for it. Okay, but here's, yeah. listen. I and just, I don't have any patience for it either. And that's when I just either say, all right, oh you know, God. call me when you're done complaining and we'll actually be productive or just stop. I'll literally say those words like stop or wow. It doesn't help. It doesn't help the situation. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm realizing that as much as we do this show, as much as we talk about this, I can know mm -hmm. that having a positive attitude oh, yeah. about things going wrong or, or whatever is one thing. But living it is another. My sense is that you have a much better batting average on this one than I do. And I'm only, wondering only in that sense. I know that exercise and diet are very important. I don't live it. I don't, you know, so it's in certain situations where I also know that being positive is very good. And just last night, Will, my 17 year old goes to me, he goes, did you have a bad day today? And I'm like, no, why? And I realized that I was just being snarky and I didn't really have a reason. I was just being snarky. And number one, I love when people call me out on it. So that's why I'm not afraid you to call love you. It? I love it because sometimes you don't realize we always talk about that resting, you know, face where somebody certain just looks, kind of face. Absolutely. Yes. And if you don't not a know, happy face. not a happy face. And if you're not aware that you're doing something, I'd rather be told because if not, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And I appreciate that feedback. And that's why you and I do so well, because we give the feedback and then you move on. It's not like you hold grudges. So Mary and I were on a call the other day. Very often lessons in leadership is about stuff that happens in our lives. And we, our attitude is we think it's happening in other people's lives as well. Mary and I were having a conversation. She had left work. She had put in a long day. She has her kids and her family, and she's dealing with a whole range of issues in her life mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with work and everything to do with life. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it was 6 or 6.30, and I called you on the phone. 6.45, sitting in my driveway. <laughs> my husband and the dog looking out the window, what's going on? Are you serious? Yeah, and I'm doing like one, one minute, one minute. And I think I was complaining about something. Yes. I was. You were, yes. And you were trying to be patient. Yeah. Well, the irony was it was about our beautiful studio here yes. with Brian and his team. Brian, thank you at again so much at East Main Media. And I think, I don't know what I was saying, but I, I was do. saying, and I'll why remind don't you, we, let's not get into the weeds. No, no, no. And I'm go not going to get into that, but it, it but all boils down to. This is a metaphor for all the other things that go around in our lives and we don't respond the right way, which is a life lesson and a leadership lesson. Yeah, go ahead. I took a deep breath and finally I said the words, I am not a producer. And I paused because I needed you to hear what I was saying, which was the thing that we were arguing about involved something that I frankly had no idea what you were talking about. You were frustrated. using words. You were talking about blocking and this and that. And I go, first of all, what is blocking? And I think I put some expletives in there. We're not talking about football or the and, NFL. And exactly. But this goes on in business every day. I said, uh, the, the, doesn't really matter mm -hmm. except I was saying, Mary, how are we going to block mm -hmm. the show? How are we going to set up yes. the show? Yeah. And I'm talking to her. Where was the leadership? Where was this? Where was that? And I paused and said, I am not a producer. And I said it like five times. And then to your credit, you realize this is an irrational conversation. All it had to be was, all right, yes. yesterday we decided that we're going to do this amazing show. And not literally. And now what I want is this. And next time, can you do it this way? And that's where you and I agree to disagree of the level of, especially at that time of day when the rest of our work beyond the television stuff and the radio stuff million that we're doing, a million things. And that's everybody everywhere multitasking. Exactly. And it is. I think that that's when you and I just hit that pause button and say, all right, recharge. What do we need to get done? And now let's fix it. So it's so funny. I often use this expression when I'm coaching people about leadership and management and communication, and I'll say, look, it's not about perfection, but sometimes it's about your batting average, meaning it's so interesting. I think that 
when I say my batting average, I mean anyone's. Mm -hmm. That my batting average when it comes to dealing with these things is a lot better than what it was. Oh, exponentially better. Okay, and I'll often tell my wife that, and she'll say I'm not impressed. So well, I didn't say how it's going at home. I'm just saying how it's going in the office. But, so. but, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's bet my batting average is better in both yeah. cases, but that's not my point. Mm -hmm. My point is this. When you're doing the thing that is not healthy and you're communicating in a counterproductive way and you're blaming and you're snarky and you've got a terrible attitude, it's not enough to turn around and go, you know what? I have a really good batting average and this is the exception. Yep. And why are we focusing on this? Because that level of defensiveness, I'm doing air quotes if you're listening on the radio or audio side, what is that? And I'll often do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like you said, number one, the batting average has been exponentially better. But who cares when you're in the middle of making a bunch of errors as exactly. a leader and as a person? Exactly. But to a leader's credit, when they step back, and you did, later on you apologized. But I was said, also afraid of you getting mad at me and quitting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't no, do I'm that just, anymore. No, swear, it's no, been years. But I'm just trying to No, I'm just trying to tell I'm you. I'm not going anywhere. Mary, I'm yeah. trying to tell you something. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason some of us step back and check ourselves is for the fear of, it's not just you leaving. No, no, that could be. It's yeah. consequences. It's consequences. Go but, ahead about but consequences. But that consequences should be every aspect of your life. If you're going into a meeting, what will be the consequences of me saying, we have an issue. If I approach it this way, what are the consequences? For better or for worse, sometimes if you're not firm enough, then you're going to have other consequences. So you really need to think every action is going to have an equal or adverse reaction, we right? We call that strategic thinking it's and strategic communication thinking and leadership. And communication and leadership. And you and I talk about the 24-hour rule. I know I beat it like a dead horse. In this case, tell folks a 24-hour rule. Yeah, 24-hour rule. If something really egregious happens, it came from sports, right? If oh, I wasn't sure. played enough or. I didn't get to be up first at bat and wait what, 24 hours before what before talking to the coach or not or not because usually the next day whatever it is that you were so upset about right. doesn't really bother you anymore is this mm -hmm. work for husbands and wives yes the 24 hour rule absolutely as does don't go to bed angry and for us it's don't end the work day angry it doesn't help i can't go to sleep i don't know if you lose sleep over it i do and i'm sure there's a lot of leaders that feel the same way wow why don't we just have mary do the show and i'll just hang around and when she needs me to jump in i will <laughs> this has been lessons in leadership with steve adubato and mary gamba we are coming to you from east main media studios in beautiful little falls new jersey and folks uh you're checking us on am 970 on the radio on our podcast and on the am 970 app as well you might be seeing us on the video side and also mary where else on facebook steve adubato phd and that's a-d-u-b-a-t-o as well as on twitter at steve adubato and you can subscribe to apple podcast and google play to get all of our past episodes lessons in leadership check you out next time <laughs> <laughs> This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Elise Glennon with New Jersey Sharing Network. The Transplant Games of America are coming to New Jersey in the summer of 2020, and we encourage you to learn more about organ and tissue donation. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. The New Jersey Education Association. The law firm of Gibbons PC. PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. The Northward Center. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and AM 970, The Answer. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We are, in fact, coming to you from the Agnes Ferris NJDV studio in Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. We are pleased to welcome State Senator Linda Greenstein, who represents the 14th Legislative District, which is where? It is in central Jersey, near Princeton, near Trenton, that whole area around there. Senator, we thank you for coming all the way up to uh, Newark. Let's jump right into this. We just had Mayor Roz Baraka check our website to see that interview. Much of that discussion was about the Newark water crisis. 
But it is not just Newark. It is other older communities with older pipes, with lead pipes, potential issues. We don't want to scare anyone. Mm -hmm. But there's a joint legislative task force on drinking water infrastructure created in 2016. What is it and how is it related to this whole discussion of water? Well, that was a task force that really is over already. Um, we presented a, a wonderful report to the legislature. It's on our legislative webpage. Um, and it talks about all of the recommendations that came out of that two-year task force. Uh, originally, we were only looking at infrastructure, the age of the pipes, the fact that people don't, are not able to disclose where they are because people don't have that information, which is amazing. And um, there really was no plan to fix a lot of the pipes. So we were pushing for that. But in addition, we looked at the lead issue because this was right after Flint, Michigan, and we wanted to see what was going on here. And we weren't surprised to find out that lead is a major problem. Serious problem in New Jersey. Yes, it is. How seriously do you believe the state, and there are many state agencies, the DEP, Department of Health and others, how seriously are we taking this situation? I think we're taking it very seriously now, particularly because of the problems in Newark. Uh, I know the mayor and others are working very hard on that and pushing to make sure that something is done. Um, prior to this, we were talking in terms of, well, we will change the lead service lines or the water service lines, I should say, within 10 years. Then it went down to three years, and I think now we're thinking even less than that. We're trying to come up with the funds to get these lines changed quickly. You know, it's interesting, Senator. We don't want to scare people, but we want to have an honest conversation. As soon as Flint gets put into this conversation, does it scare the heck out of people? Well, I think the reputation that Flint got was that um, this could happen to you. So but it's that true. was why. And it, it is true, although there... Uh, there was a particular situation where they changed their water supply and that seemed to lead to the problems. Here we just have that aging infrastructure. Um, there are chemicals that you can put into the pipes that will take the lead away, but even that takes time. You have to flush the system. Uh, it takes time for that to work. And also checking as to how uh, the efficacy, if you will, of those chemicals, and Mayor Baraka talked about that as well. Right, and filters haven't even worked, and that's frightening, uh, uh, I think. Exactly. Um, the cost, go back to that. You understand fiscal issues in the state better than most. You understand constituents' response to fiscal <laughs> issues. Yes, we How do. honest can we be, should we be, in terms of saying, look, if, if you want clean water, it's going to cost us billions, and it sounds like Carl Sagan right now, I'm dating myself. Billions, billions and billions. and billions of dollars to do this over a period of time, which potentially means, even with the borrowing and the bonding, Senator, potentially means significant tax increases. Yes. Do you think the public's ready for that conversation because you know they want clean water? Yes. Well, looking at the Newark situation, the issue is the water service lines that go from the street to the person's right. house. They're not very long. And um, the amount to fix those, while it's large, is not astronomical. It is I'm talking doable. about a statewide crisis. Oh, OK. I'm well, talking statewide, not just yeah. Newark. If you were doing everything, it is a very large number. And Newark, um, just, just using that as an example, uh, it really is the responsibility of the homeowner believe it or not, Wait to minute. fix those, I, but it's, that's not how, how it's being it, done. Listen, if we're here in Newark where we're taping at NJTV. How many homeowners do you think can come up with the thousands of dollars necessary to do that? It's five to $8,000 they're talking about. I don't think most people can. And that's the reason why first Essex County gave a grant. Of a hundred, the, no, no, it wasn't a grant. It was $120 million. Uh, I, they mm -hmm. bonded for that over bonded a period for. of time. Yes. That the city of Newark is on the hook for. Mm. I want to be clear. But they bonded, because right. bar Newark couldn't borrow the money on its own. Right. And individual homeowners really can't do it. There's talk about the state providing funding for this. Mm. Um, frankly, I think it's fair. While the water line is the homeowners, mm. this is not just a water line. This is a public health crisis. And in that case, I think the state should be responsible. As you're talking about a public health crisis, uh, last question I want to bring up, climate change. Not just nationally, but in New Jersey. New Jersey, this is real. Oh, it absolutely is, because we have the big shore area. Um, there are many creative things that are being looked at, um, but we absolutely have to do everything we can, first of all. 
uh, the governor in his energy master plan that he's just put out. Um, the first thing he has in there is electrifying the transportation system. I'm very big with that. I've been one of the first sponsors of the electric car bills about five years ago, and they've worked that in. Um, they want to electrify buses and, and all other means of transportation. That will get rid of a lot of the greenhouse gases and, and problems that we have. For those who blow this off, no disrespect to the president, the president has said he questions some of the science of climate change. You say? I say he's wrong. <laughs> Because um, I, I believe that the science does show that, uh, that this is a big problem and that we have to do something about it. A national crisis, not yes. simply state by state. Yes. And if we don't, we would have a repeat of Hurricane S or Superstorm Sandy, but on a basis that would be much larger and uh, could really decimate our shore. We don't want that to happen. It goes inland, too, so it's a major problem. Senator, how long have you been in the legislature? 20 years. Senator Linda... Greenstein, who represents uh, 14th District, which is Trenton, no, it, it outside actually, of Trenton? It's Hamilton all the way up to Spotswood over to Plainsville. 15th District is the Trenton. That's right. Could you imagine it, those things in my head? That's pretty good. Well, <laughs> never mind. Uh, listen, Linda, thank you so much for joining us, Senator. Appreciate it. Great to be here. This thank is you. State of Affairs. She came all the way up from uh, Central Jersey to be with us. We appreciate it. We're we'll right back on State of Affairs right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm Steve Adubato. We are on the campus of NJIT in Newark, New Jersey for the second annual Voice Summit. That's right, the largest Voice Summit in the world. And a gentleman who actually wrote about this in his publication, ROI, uh, Return on Information New Jersey, is Tom Bergeron, the editor. Tom, when I first read this article on the print side, many people read it on the digital side as well. The case for voice. Uh, you were talking to Pete Erickson. Um, we check out all of our programs. Pete put this thing together. He's with Modev. 5,000 attendees here, 1,000 students attending on scholarship, 400 speakers and panelists, 250 programs and panels, 125 sponsors, 25 countries represented, it goes on and on. How big a deal is this? This is a huge deal. It's a huge deal for Newark, it's a huge deal for New Jersey. Uh, it, it, you can't underestimate how important this is and what it's become in just its second year. What could it mean? Break it down. Well, I'll, I'll give you three examples of why it's good. They talk about last year. Every hotel in the city sold out. $5 million of economic impact. Now, I don't know how you measure economic impact, but I know in every hotel is sold, you got a lot of people here going to restaurants, going to bars, Ubers, whatever it is, it's bringing it here. Yep. That was last year. This year is doubled in size. Next year could easily be doubled in size to that. So you have those numbers right there. Then you have number two. I'm at a table down there listening to the keynote today this morning. The woman By next to me- Is Bisky? Is Bisky, yeah, Bisky. who happens to be an NJIT grad, yep. right? Went to school in Newark. Who's at my table? Two people from Australia. Okay, so what, tell me one other event this century that's going to get two people from Australia soon. to come from, to, to Australia. And, but and, why does that matter, that people why, from around the world come here? Here's why it matters, because they don't know Newark. They know what they see today, what they see this week. So if I'm an Australian company, or I'm a German company, or I'm a company from anywhere in the Soviet, Russia, anywhere, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, this is your first look at Newark. And all you're saying is, this is pretty cool. This is, this is a high-tech city. First impressions matter. First impressions matter a lot, right? So they come in, they see all of the technology you have in here, the high-speed internet you have here. That's fantastic. And what do they do? They bring it all back. So every company in the world needs to have a, a presence in New York. As far as they know, Newark is New York. And it's 10 cents on the dollar, right? When you talk about all the savings. Right. So all of these companies are going back to where they were from, and they're talking up Newark. So that's great for the city. And here's number three. You go down some of the rows here for all of the entrepreneurs. I meet these guys on Gamify. Two kids from Newark, right? You shouldn't say kids, they're 30, entrepreneurs, right? They've, they've done some apps, they decided to get in a voice. So they came up with this really cool um, product where if you're a gamer, you can clip your, your clip or whatever you want to do, send it out on social media. That all happened in Newark. So when you talk about the thousand kids that are here, most of these kids are Newark or Essex County kids. So what are we doing? What is this event doing? 
creating, creating all the next kinds generation. of opportunities for people going to a field that they didn't even know existed. Right. You want to talk about economic opportunity five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? I was here yesterday, you had third graders from Newark walking around at here the learning Voice about Summit. at the Voice Summit. At the Voice Public Summit. Public school kids. Public, there's no other public school in the in, uh, city in the country where 500 kids, 1,000 kids came in and learned about voice. Let me ask you, for ROI, for your publication, by the way, check out our website. We're uh, media partners with ROI. Deciding to cover an event like this and putting it on the front page, voice activated, and then you've got two articles here, one about the voice and also about the connection to NGIT and what it means. Right. And to disclose again, NGIT is one of our high, uh, higher education media partners. I just want to put that out there. How do you actually make a decision, A, to cover it, and B, how do you cover it because it's so big? It's so big, it's so broad, and how does it affect New Jersey business, right? So we do two ways. We found about it last year, we came last year, we said, if a major international event, business event, is gonna come to Newark, we're gonna cover it because that's the kind of stuff that we do. Now, how do we find a way to cover it where we talked to someone yesterday, I talked to someone at Realogy, right? Realogy, a real estate company, okay. right? Madison, right, huge company. What do they have to do with voice? I'm wondering, why are they here? They're, well, they're here because they, they got into voice about six months ago. This month, they're introducing Agent X, they're calling it, a voice-activated system for all their realtors. On They figured out how voice works for them. So we write the story, and we talk about how did Realogy find out about it? Surprise, surprise, they actually talked to their employees and mm. said, what do you need? How does this work? So we try to present this to the New Jersey business community. Someone saying, ah, voice doesn't, doesn't apply to me. Yeah. It does. It applies to everything. So we're sort of planting the seed for other companies that maybe you should look into that. The other thing about ROI um, is that they do policy. They examine policy questions and issues. We don't do a lot of politics. You only look at politics as a con in terms of this, how politics impacts policy, which impacts the business community and all of us. There's a point here, trust me. We just had an interview with an attorney that talked about the questions and challenges for all of us in society in regulating and managing confidentiality, um, access to information, financial and personal in voice, and that government agencies, policymakers, be they elected or appointed, are so far behind oh, on this. Oh, a, a generation behind. Okay. Do you see that as an area that ROI potentially looks at and says, hey, wait a minute, we saw this going on, we saw the tip of the iceberg, you have a responsibility to do these things. But do they even know what that means? They don't, they don't what, understand. Excuse me, what's the committee in the state legislature or in the United States Congress that would be prepared to, loaded question I know, examine these issues? They, could, they couldn't examine Facebook when they had the chance. They were, they yeah, were unfamiliar we know with there. that, right? So how are they going to do some of this technology, which is all six months, 12 months, 18 months old, right? So that's a nice challenge for Frank and the guys at Gibbons on how do you get well, ahead Frank of all Frank Canone is who you're talking about. Check out that conversation. Is it part of your job to put pressure on these officials to get into this space and deal with it? I wouldn't use the word pressure. I would use the word um, we want, to bring, uh, we want to bring it to light. We want to let them know that it's out there. We want to let them know the issues that people are facing, whether it's regulatory issues. When you get an economic development, you can talk about incentive issues, and let's not go to the incentive game. You can talk about all of the different rules and regulations they would have on high-speed fiber and how it works, this and that, and show how this will impact whether these companies that we're talking about sure. are going to come to New Jersey and come to Newark. What do we have that works and doesn't work? Final so our question. job will be just to shed light on it. Final question. Um, so there are folks who say, well, uh, your publication, what we do in public broadcasting and all of our other platforms on Fios and uh, the NPR systems who carry us as well, as well as our friends at uh, AM 970 in New York. Yeah, well, that's for a bunch of insiders. That's for people who follow politics and government and business. And that's not the average person. It seems to me the average person is affected by is dealing with and consumes voice technology. This is not an insider game. Right. And people don't realize how much voice technology is taking over their lives already. Some of the speakers today are talking about where it goes from this year and three years back and five years back. You don't understand how much you do it. it but once you start doing it and you start seeing how helpful it is and how conversational, how natural it is, more and more companies are coming into it and more and more consumers are gonna see it in their daily life whether they realize it first or not. Right now, it might just be setting their thermostat, right? Or getting a drink of water and making sure they're, or telling someone to start the coffee maker. 
but more and more is coming every day, so it impacts everybody. Tom Bergeron is the editor of ROI, Return on Information New Jersey, again, to disclose they're one of our media partners. Hey, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from The Voice Summit in Newark, New Jersey, and NJIT. This is big stuff. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. That's right, we are at MetLife Stadium for the Celebrating Life and Liberty event. You can hear the music playing in just a, about an hour or so. There will be about 6,000 people here. We're honored to be talking to uh, Robert Garrett. Bob Garrett is CEO. So we're actually going to be doing a half-hour special on this event, talking to uh, survivors, family members, um, clinicians, others who are part of this event. But right now we want to talk to Bob about some uh, important healthcare issues. So if I say to you, Trends in healthcare, big picture, you say? Big picture, I'd say uh, first and foremost, I'd say that consolidation in the healthcare industry continues to mergers? accelerate. Mergers, acquisitions, affiliations, partnerships. Uh, we've seen a lot of it. We're gonna continue to see that happen. I think it's actually not a bad thing. I think it's actually a very, very good thing because when um, health systems can consolidate and can merge, you can share best practices. So clinical care can improve. You can also um, not duplicate services and um, reach some efficiencies and some synergies. So hopefully healthcare becomes more affordable, more accessible. You get to a certain size and scale that you're able to reinvest in the communities that we serve. So um, those, those trends are gonna continue to happen. I think the market just continues to change. It's gonna be really hard for the, the, um, the old time community hospital, the freestanding community hospital to really be able to survive without at least an affiliation, at least a partnership if you not. You need scale. Yeah, you need the scale to really um, survive. The other big trend that I see, Steve, is um, healthcare. We, we know that more and more healthcare is being provided outside of the four walls of the hospital. So, you know, you see more ambulatory care uh, popping up, whether it's retail healthcare um, centers, surgery centers, fitness and wellness centers. But now the big trend is really toward home care. Home and, care. Yes. And the future of healthcare is really healthcare being delivered in the home with the right technology. And um, that's, that's really gonna be key because, um, and it's almost like what goes around comes around. I mean, if you think about back in the, the Middle Ages, um, that's where healthcare was really being delivered in the home. It's going back to the home, but this time it's gonna be with technology. So- Well, hold on, Bob, I'm curious yeah. about this. The technology part of it, yes. talk about innovation a lot. Actually check out our website, you'll see an entire series we're doing on innovation. With the innovation, with the technology, but go back Doctors or physicians would come to your house, you know, we'd think the old right. school bag, right? You and I are too young to remember that. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, the technology with physicians and clinicians, how do you keep the human connection? So it's gonna be through a virtual uh, connection. So through your smartphone where you can receive health information, you can actually get physician consults through telehealth, through telemedicine. That's really gonna be where the connection is. And you know, where it's actually already happening, uh, patient um, satisfaction is actually improving because physicians are and, and other providers are spending more quality time with patients as opposed to being rushed in a crowded office where you know you have office hours, a certain, you know, certain number of minutes, a certain number of hours, and you know, there's a big backup and the physicians, you know, they want to spend more time with their patients, but they really can't because they got an office full of people. This way they can really schedule these these so-called virtual home visits um, at different times during the day. We're seeing actually uh, where it's where it's happening now, uh, patient experience is actually improving. Kaiser Permanente out on the West Coast in California, almost half of all of their visits now, their physician patient visits are done um, through telehealth and telehealth. Not face to face. Not face to face. And, 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 and patients, many, are saying, we're good with this? We're good with this, yeah. And um, even in the hospital. So good examples are we have shortages in certain uh, specialties, like in psychiatry. So if a patient needs a psychiatric consultation. Excuse me, but telepsychiatry? Tele telepsychiatry. So in community hospitals, in communities where psychiatrists are in short supply, a patient can, on a timely basis, get a psychiatric consultation while they're in the hospital because they might wait otherwise a day, two days, or three days for that psychiatric consultation. Much more efficient, much more um, 
much better for the patients mm. if they get it on a timely basis. The other thing that's happening, and we're just opening for the first time a behavioral health urgent care center. And through behavioral health urgent care, uh, patients will be able to get uh, telepsychiatry uh, visits in that setting as well. So instead of patients having to go into a crowded emergency department, uh, wait for sometimes hours, if not days, for psychiatric consultation, they can get almost an instantaneous consultation in a uh, behavioral health urgent care center. First one opening in September um, in uh, Neptune, New Jersey. Innovation is not a choice. It's something that goes on on a regular basis, has to happen, particularly responding to patient demands and needs. The other thing is I want to talk a little bit about, Bob, Bob and I have talked about leadership a lot, and to fully disclose, I do uh, leadership uh, and communication coaching within the network, and also your network is one of the big supporters of uh, what we're doing in public broadcasting. But I'm curious about this. Mergers, you started talking right. about that. I did. Hackensack Meridian. <clears throat> How many years in now? We're three years in. Okay, if I said to you, number one lesson you've learned and that others should learn or could learn from the merger you say is? I'd say the number one lesson is focus on integration, particularly cultural integration. What, is that? what do you mean integration? So here's what I mean is you, could, you can have a merger and yet these hospitals can still be independent entities, almost like a confederation of hospitals, very loose or you can have a highly integrated system where you do share those best practices and clinical care improves, or you, uh, you put all the health records on one electronic health uh, record system. Easier That's, said than done. It's easier said than done. It's hard work, but the integration pays off because if you're really gonna get the benefits of being a healthcare system or a healthcare network, you have to integrate. And you can have the best strategies in the world, but if you don't have a unified culture that's strong and united and everybody's aligned in the same way, guess what? Those strategies are not gonna survive. You're not gonna be successful. So getting one culture when you have 35,000 team members and um, 8,500 providers is not an easy, uh, easy task. You gotta work at it constantly. So the lesson learned is, you know, you can't integrate too much. You can't focus on culture too much. Um, you know, not that strategy is easy to either develop or execute. But culture? But, but culture, culture is, uh, is, is what's going to sustain you. Everything could look fine on paper. Right. Right? The numbers look right, economies of scale, we can save money, we can provide better patient care. But if you don't come together as human beings and work together, it doesn't work, no matter what the numbers look like. That, that's absolutely right. It's you know, it's kind of uh, an old adage about it's it's about people, right? And uh, people aren't aligned if they don't have the same focus, the same mission, the same vision, the same values. And we re we redid everything at Hackensack Meridian. We wanted to give our mission a fresh look, a fresh uh, way of uh, people identifying with it. We have a new vision. We have um, some core values, and we do various events um, in person, virtually, to really get our team members really align with that mission vision value. Communicating not easy with that many people. Not that easy. So, you know, see, one of the things that we do is in addition to rounding, in addition to a lot of events I do in person, um, like the event here at MetLife Stadium, uh, we do have virtual town hall meetings as well. So we, uh, we do them like three or four times a year and uh, we show them to team members all around the network at their convenience, not at our convenience, because they're, you know, our, our physicians, our nurses, our technicians are working hard every, every day. And we wanna make sure that when, when they're ready to hear the message, we can deliver it and you can do that virtually. I, it doesn't take the place of being there in person, but it, it's a great method when you have 35,000 team members at 500 different locations. For those of you watching State of Affairs, you're used to seeing us in the studio. We're out here on location. This is the Celebrating Life and Liberty event here at MetLife Stadium. And um, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, the New Jersey Education Association, the law firm of Gibbons PC, PSCNG, the Northward Center, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and AM 970, The Answer. I think at NJIT, there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state, it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. 
It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion. 